I'll let you know when we've started. How many people we are waiting for? I think we'll have about 90. Um, bear okay. with me just a moment. Tim, Tim lost connection, but I think he's coming back. Oh, bear with me. I'm glad that not, I'm not the only one with problems with the computer. <laughs> it's one of those days. Lovely. I'm the host now, so I'll start the <laughs> webinar. Right, we're ready to go. Hello, members. Good evening. We'll just allow you a moment whilst you all join. Good evening. Good evening. So welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see so many of you flooding in. Apologies for the small delay. We had a couple of connection issues, but we're all resolved. Uh, it's lovely to see you all, like I said, and even lovelier to be able to welcome Sarah Knowles, MW, our buyer for Italy, and of course, Martin of Hofstadter tonight. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating evening. I love this region. Really, really excited myself. Uh, so before we do get started, I am going to do a very small bit of housekeeping. Uh, some of you will have heard it many times, so I apologise. But just a, a bit of best practice in how the tastings team at the Wine Society like to use Zoom. So first of all, we're joined by uh, Catherine and Tim behind the scenes tonight. If you have any technical issues of your own, please feel free to email them tastings at the wine society .com, and they will be able to handle any of your woes. Um, we do ask you to do that so that we can keep the chat clear, because in the chat, we'd like to hear where you are and what you're drinking. And hopefully... It's one of Martin's wines, but do let us know if it's a wine from the region or an Italian wine that you've picked out to enjoy tonight. Last, but certainly by no means least, we have the Q&A button. Now, please do use that Q&A button in order to ask questions. It's much easier for our team behind the scenes to be able to grab those questions from that section. So uh, hopefully it's at the bottom of your device and you can see a nice Q&A. Now, uh, I'm going to be going off camera shortly, but we do encourage you to uh, watch with both cameras on this evening. So you'll have Sarah and Martin side by side in what's due to be a lovely, conversational, relaxed evening, learning a little bit more about Martin and enjoying some of his wines as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sarah Knowles, MW, buyer for Italy extraordinaire and uh, confessed lover of these wines too. So cheers and good evening. Good evening, Anna. Thank you for that introduction. And um, hello, members. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I always feel that um, bank holiday weeks uh, in the UK seem to go very quickly. So I'm completely confused as to what day it is. But I'm pretty sure it's a Wednesday, which means it's hump day and a lovely day to be having a glass of wine with you all. Um, I'm really pleased. Oh, there goes the train. I should warn any members who haven't seen me on Zoom before, but I, I do have six train lines outside my window, so apologies for the noise, and it's why I will mute quite frequently. Um, however, I'm delighted to, to introduce these wines to you tonight with Martin here. Um, Alto DJ, where these wines are from, is one of the regions of Italy that really um, first captivated me when I visited. It's one of those regions that I, I wholly suggest you all book a flight to as soon as we get out of this um, sort of lockdown scenario and, you know, travel is difficult and all the rest of it. But um, this area is a stunningly beautiful place in Italy, in the Dolomite Hills. And when I first went, I went with the Master of Wine um, trip. It was a student trip organized by the, the wine body in the association of, of these um, Alto DJ wines. And it was an incredible joy to suddenly see such a, a match of crystalline wines in a very pure and crystalline looking region with these sort of incredible um, glacial rivers and mountain views and blue skies. And these wines seem to echo um, the region that they're from in a way 
that I think is so clearly linked and I really enjoy seeing. I also first visited Hofstadter uh, back when Sebastian was taking me around Italy that introduced me to the key suppliers that we've worked with for many years. And I'm really glad that we have been working with Martin's Wines for a number of years at the Wine Society, one of Sebastian's um, favorite producers of fantastic uh, Pinot Bianco, but also La Gran and Pinot Nero. And we are excited to, to continue to list a full range of the wines um, at the Wine Society for you all to enjoy. So Martin, I won't take up too much of members' times. I know they want to hear, hear from you. Uh, so I will pass over to you, but thank you so much for joining us. It is an absolute pleasure. Uh, and it's always lovely to have an excuse to enjoy your wines. So cheers, everybody. Martin. So Sarah, thank you very much for the, the wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. And of course, also from my side, uh, a big hello from Northern Italy to the, to the UK. Uh, it's a lovely day here, or actually the day is going, is, is over. I spent most of the time in the vineyard checking, checking the grapes today. And if the weather is going on like this for the next four weeks, uh, I think we will have uh, for sure the vintage of the century. It's incredible. We have warm days and we have cool nights. In my, let me say, 30 years career, I've never seen a weather condition like we have this year. So let's cross fingers that the next four weeks are going on like this. Uh, we will start with the harvest in approximately 10, maximum four, 14 days with the flatter part of the valley. And then we slowly will grow up. We will grow up uh, the hills. But yeah, again, let's let's cross fingers. Um, I've preferred I prepared a few slides for you uh, that will help me a little bit uh, go through my presentation and go through that what I want to tell you and show you also uh, a few pictures here from a winery and generally speaking. Um, from Alto Adige, and yes, uh, German sounding name winery, but we are in Italy. So allow me to take over the, the screen. And yeah, let's start. Uh, I think first of all, why this German sounding name uh, in, in Italy? It's very easy. My region, Alto Adige or Südtirol, how we say uh, in German. Why German? Because 80% of the population in Alto Adige is German speaking, as I am. And for second language, uh, we, have it, we have Italian. So Alto Adige started to be a part of Italy after World War I. But before that, it was a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And of course, our roots are still, let me say, more in the direction Austrian uh, than, uh, than, than Italy. But today we are in, let me say, in this beautiful Europe. We are in the middle uh, of Europe. And it's a beautiful connection between uh, German mentality and Italian lifestyle, what we have here. Uh, in Alto Adige. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Hofstetter. I prepared uh, here uh, 10 facts. And let's start, let's start with the family. So uh, the winery itself was founded in 1907 from uh, Maria Hofstetter that you see uh, on, on the presentation uh, right now and his husband, uh, Joseph, in the middle of the village Tramin in Termeno. But let's talk about the, let me say, this mystery Tramin, the uh, a little a little bit later. So uh, Maria and Joseph Hofstetter, they were the first generation who started the business. And uh, the second generation was my grandpa that you see in the picture right now. And he was Konrad Oberhofer. Out of this marriage, uh, one daughter, which was my, my mother, who married Paolo Foradori, who originally was uh, from Trentino, which is the Italian uh, speaking part uh, or the next province south of Alto Adige, where they speak 
in Italian. Uh, the winery itself is downtown in the village Tramin. So you see here uh, an old picture from the 1900. So uh, yeah, you see the big church tower on the background of the winery. It's a, it's a church tower from 1492. So we sent Columbus to America and in my beautiful village, we, we built, uh, we built uh, this church tower. So as you can see from what's written on the house, K and K Postfab Unternehmung Gasthof zum Schwarzen Adler. So this was an inn, and the inn was run by Maria Hofstetter. And the beginning was that yeah, Maria ran the inn, and Joseph Hofstetter made the wine. So this was the start of the winery. Joseph Hofstetter was also the blacksmith. Uh, of uh, of the village, but uh, he soon realized that it's better uh, to make money or better run a business with wine than to be the blacksmith of, of the village. Yeah, I already explained the second generation, which was my grandfather, uh, mother's side. The first generation was my father, who unfortunately passed away uh, last, uh, last December. And now it's run by myself uh, since 92 in fourth, in fourth generation. And I hope that soon the fifth generation will start to work in the winery, in the winery uh, too. So in terms of size, um, as Joseph Hofstetter, we are one of the biggest, one of the biggest wineries in Alto Adige. But when I say big, it doesn't mean bottles that we do. It means vineyard land, uh, vineyard land that uh, we own. So Alto Adige at all is one of the smallest wine growing regions uh, in Italy. So the whole production of Alto Adige in wine is less than 1% of the Italian production. So we are a little bit nobodies in terms of wine quantity in Italy. And also the vineyard land in Alto Adige is split down in very small parcels. So the average property of a farmer in Alto Adige is approximately 8,000 square meters. And in the family, we run 55 hectares. Uh, most of them are in uh, Alto Adige, but uh, 2017, I expanded my property also in the southern part of Tarantino, which is the next, uh, the next region south. Yeah, uh, Sarah was uh, telling you how fascinating Alto Adige is. And yeah, I can underline uh, this. We are in Northern Italy, south of the Alps, and yeah, the, the, the diversity is very important. First of all, there is to say that we start to grow vineyards at 250 meters over the sea level, and we go up as family or as winery up to 850 meters over the sea level. So there is quite a range of different microclimatic situation where we grow, uh, where we grow our grapes. Uh, very important uh, uh, is to underline uh, also the fact between microclimate change between east and west part of the valley. So we have the warmer west part and we have the cooler, the cooler uh, east part. If you put all these facts all together, we have the reason because in Alto Adige we grow that many different grape varieties because that's what grows perfectly at 300 meters over the level. For example, a variety like the Schiava, which is a local grape variety, or a variety like the Lagrain, which is local too, they grow perfectly at 300 meters. Never, we cannot plant them at 500, 600 meters over the, over the sea level, but we can plant their Chardonnay, we can plant their Pinot Bianco for, for example. Yeah, and this is the reason why we have all these varieties uh, in different varieties in Alto Adige compared to other regions. So in this slide, you see, uh, this is a, a slide of the estate 
named Oberkirschbaum. Here we are at 750 meters over the sea level. And this is on the border, on the southern border uh, to Alto Adige. But, and that what you see on the flat part of the valley, this is still Trentino, which is the next, the next province south. So here, especially uh, in this estate, we grow, we grow Sauvignon, we grow Sauvignon uh, Blanc. Yeah, and here we go. The fact number four, the importance of West and East. First of all, there is to say that fortunately, we are the only family owned winery here in this part of Alto Adige who owns vineyard on East and on the, on the West side. So in very different microclimatic situation. But let me, show, let me show why. So you see in this picture, uh, on the background shadow in front, you see the sun. So this is the, sun, the morning sun. In the west, we have the sun. And on the east, we are still in shadow. This is the, yeah, let me say famous Adige Valley. The Adige is the river that you see on the right side of the screen. Of the screen. Um, and everything, what you see on the flat part of the valley are apple trees. So Alto Arige is also one or, yeah, probably the most important apple trees production area uh, in Europe. But as you know, uh, the vines doesn't like to have their roots in water. Fortunately, the, the vines or the vineyards are on hillside in the valley. And it's at the opposite for the apples. They like to have the, their roots in the water, so they grow on the flat part of the valley. But now, let me, let me explain you uh, the difference between east and west. So in this picture, you see the, the sun power. So as darker the color is, more sun the vineyards have. Let me go in detail. This is where my village Tramin is and where the winery is located. And on the opposite side, you see the village Mazon, M-A-Z-O-N. This is where we have our vineyards on the east part of the valley. And now let's overlap the other map. You see Tramin here. And you see Matson on the, on the other side of the valley. Take a look at the color. You see a dark color on the Tramin side, which is the west side. And you see, you see uh, an almost orange yellow color on the east side of the valley. Translated in hours of sun, on the west side, we have 1,000 hours of sun more than on the east. And to go from A to B, from one side of the valley to the other, we are not talking about, I don't know how, 10 miles. No, we are talking about 3.54 kilometers, which is almost, I guess, 2.5 miles. So you have this incredible microclimatic change in such a small area. And for us, this is a great fortune and also a great honor because we, are, we have vineyards on the warm side. So we have perfect vineyards to grow our main red variety, white variety, which is the Gewürztraminer. And we have beautiful or the perfect vineyards to grow Pinot Noir in the cooler spot, in the cooler spot of, uh, of the valley. Here you see where our uh, vineyards are located. So we have on the west side, the Steinraffler estate where we grow our like Rhine grape. Then we have the Kolbenhof estate and the Rechtenthaler Schlossleiten, uh, which are in the, say, in the, in the, in the fillet piece in the heart of the Wirtsamino Pro production area. And on the other side, you have the area Matson, which I already mentioned, with the two Ingram estates and the Bartolo estates. And this is how I used to say this is it Italy's Pinot Noir Pinot land. And a little bit south, you have the Oberkirschbaum, which I already mentioned. You have seen the pictures before. And then we don't have it on the map. We have the Mazomike, which is my new project in, uh, in, uh, in Trentino. So I think we can, I can go over, over that slides. This is the mapping of the different, of the different uh, states. They are not so important right now. 
Yeah, here you have the Mazumike. This is my high altitude uh, or my new high altitude spot. We are here on uh, approximately the altitude of the Garda Lake, but we are in the middle of the mountain, as you can see. So the house itself, the estate is at 823 meters over the sea level and the vineyards, they go up at 850 meters over the sea level. So we have an incredible uh, fresh climate up here. And of course, we grow mostly white grape varieties, such uh, Müller Thurgau, Sauvignon Blanc. On the lower altitude, we have a little Pinot, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And here I produce since 2018, also a little bit, a little bit of sparkling wine uh, too. Yeah, the varieties, I already mentioned this. Uh, we have many different varieties. Uh, the most important for my winery is the Gewürztraminer grape variety, which you have uh, in, uh, in this picture uh, right now. Followed by Pinot. Um, we have a strong connection with Pinot that I'll explain a little bit later. Here is a picture of the Pinot grape of last year. Uh, vineyard um, uh, picking, sorry. So this is Walter. Walter is one of the growers who is selling uh, meat grapes and he is picking or harvesting the Schiava uh, grape variety, which is a local indigenous grape variety known for the fresh, light, easy drinking wines. Pinot Bianco, my beloved uh, Pinot Bianco. Uh, of course, it's not an indigenous grape variety, but we used to say that the Pinot Bianco is, is, uh, is indigenous. It's a variety who is in a certain way here forever, and we grow this variety, yes, many, many, many years. And last but not least, the local hero, this is the Lagrain grape variety. Uh, like the Schiava, it's an indigenous grape variety here from Alto Adige. But compared to the Schiava, the Lagrain gives more or produce, produce uh, more dark red color wines with a strong tannic structure. Yeah, this is a picture of a new project of mine, which we started 2015. I installed in the roof of my winery a grape drying system as they do in the Veneto when they produce the Amarone. And yeah, we do a small portion of Lagrain. We make it in the, in the, Lagrain, in the Amarone stylistic too. Yeah, and to finish with the sweet wines, you see here a cluster of uh, Gewürztraminer with, uh, yeah, beautiful botrytis on it and that's how we produce our dessert or our sweet wines uh, of uh, Gewürztraminer. Here another picture again. So this is those are, those are uh, grapes which we pick approximately mid-November every year. Yeah, Gewürztraminer and uh, Pinot Nero. Here you see an old picture of our Kolbenhof uh, estate, which is uh, our most important estate for the production of Gewürztraminer. Uh, yeah, it's no longer uh, a mystery, uh, or let me say it in other words, the hometown of the Gewürztraminer grape variety is not the village, Tramin. For many, many years, but if you if you take a look in old wine books, there is always written that the Gewürztraminer uh, is from the village uh, Tramin because uh, yes, we have documents for, from, for from the 14th century where they mention a wine named Traminer, but we today we know that the Traminer. Uh, out or which is uh, mentioned in this old documents was not the Gewürztraminer as we know it, but Traminer was, uh, let me say, something geographic. At this time, they put together here in the village all the different white grape varieties and they named the wine with the name of the village. So this was the Traminer and the equivalent was the red 
Traminer, which was a blend of all the different red grape varieties, which at this time for sure was the Schiava and the Lagrain, but they named the wine with the name of the village. So the Gewürztraminer that we grow today was, we started here in Alpuadige to plant uh, the today Gewürztraminer approximately in 19, in the, uh, on the end of the 19th century. And the reason for this was the Archduke uh, Johann, which was the brother of the Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Josef. So this gentleman was very close uh, to agriculture. And thanks to him, we have today, we have the international varieties such as Merlot, Cabernet, Pinot, Gewürztraminer, Chardonnay, Sauvignon, and Pinot Bianco. This is thanks to the Archduke uh, Johann, who introduced these varieties uh, to Alto Adige. And here we go, Ludwig Bart von Bartenau. Thanks to this gentleman, we have Pinot in our vineyards. He was a chemistry professor at the University of Vienna and approximately 150 years ago, he built the, the building that you see in uh, this picture, the Bartenau estate. And uh, yeah, thanks to him, we have Pino because when 1941, my grandfather bought this estate, we already found Pino there. And yeah, we were very lucky about this. And still today we have the, let me see, the oldest Pino vines uh, in Alto Adige, but probably and probably uh, in Italy. But what's interesting is that 1941 until 1958, nothing special happened with our Pinot. Before uh, my mother and my father get married, my grandfather and my father joined the Hofstetter winery. My grandfather sold the, the let me say, the noble Pinot grapes to another winery here in my village. And yeah, this winery used the Pinot grapes to blend into the Schiava wine. Yeah, those strange times but at this time in the in the 50s uh, in the 40s 30s 40s 50s nobody was asking for a pinot from alto adige but they were looking only for the schiava wines so uh, pinot uh, in my winery and pinot for the area Mazzon, how is named the area where the bartenau estate is located uh, the pinot started to boom let me use these words this word uh, starting with 1959 when my father put all his energy and love into into this variety yeah and this is the reason why uh, my winery yeah in a certain way started to get famous uh started to get famous yeah it's because it's because pinot yeah the roots this is also very important because uh, i'm let me say a winemaker, a vintner who is strongly influenced by Burgundy. How can it be different when you love Pinot, you must be influenced, uh, influenced by, by Burgundy. And that's also how my grandfather and after that my father uh, also, uh, we always loved as they do still in Burgundy to name our wines after the vineyards where they are born. Of course, we have also estate wines, which are named only by the variety. But when it comes to, when it comes to uh, our selections, they all carry the name of the origin vineyard or the estate where, where they are born. So this is very important to us. Let me very fast explain you the term vinya. Vinya, which translated means the vineyard. Uh, the name vinya is carried in all our single vineyard wines, but it's, it is not that, that easy how it seems because first of all, if you name a vine vinya, you have to declare exactly the parcel where this wine or where the grapes are from. 
So this means that if the parcel is an acre big, you can only produce the amount of bottles and the amount after the amount of bottle, of course, before you have to produce uh, the grapes, which are, which are allowed by law. So this is not how we used to say uh, a cask with, 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 without a bottom, this cask has a bottom because it's very strict and the vineyard comes to the, is the equivalent a little bit as the Grand Cru in Burgundy. And we take this, this uh, very serious. The vineyard was introduced uh, by my father, uh, first in Alto Adige in 1987, with the selection that he did at this time out from the vigneto Sant, uh, Sant'Urbano. Today, uh, seven wines carry the name or the classification vineyard in, on uh, their label. Good. Let me go through a few pictures of the vineyard, strong by nature. This is the way how we prune our grapes. Of course, uh, we have different flowers, different herbs that we plant uh, every day. No herbicide, of course. Yeah, whoa, this is a crazy picture. Probably you're wondering because we have fires in the vineyard. Yeah, those are the crazy times that we are living. Uh, fortunately, not this year, but 2017, for example, we had frost in our vineyards and mostly the the, the vines or which are on a little, let me say a little bit uh, flatter altitude were affected and to go against the frost uh, yeah we made fires in the vines to to protect to protect the uh, the very delicate the, the very delicate uh, shoots this year fortunately we were not affected by frost uh, i know that other regions Europe had problems with frost, but yeah, thank God, not in Alto Adige. And how the climate uh, is changing, you see it also in this picture here. Take a look at that, and then I will explain you what we do here. But first, take a look at the video here. Almost half of my vineyards are protected with nets against hail. Hail is making us very, very nervous. Uh, do we have more hail compared uh, to the past? Uh, a little bit, but the hail is much more intense as I remember it from 10 years, 20 or 30, 30 years ago. So 2018, I took the decision to put these nets on my, on my, uh, yeah, on my vineyards to protect against, against the hail. And yeah, it's, uh, of course they are, those nets are not cheap. It takes a lot of work to open them and uh, to close them. Yeah, but uh, thanks to this, I sleep a little bit better. And yeah, here we come to the winery. Here you see our, let me say, latest edition of 2013. This is a uh, cellar uh, where we installed, uh, yeah, a reasonable amount of uh, concrete, concrete uh, tanks. Uh, here we go. Uh, here we mostly, uh, we use them for the red wine uh, fermentation. So a concrete was a little bit out of fashion uh, in the last, in the last 20 years, because everything started with oak barrels or oak cask. Then uh, during the 40s, 50s, concrete was introduced. After that, stainless steel. Stainless steel went into the cellar, then the barracks. And now we have a little bit of renaissance of this, of, of concrete. And uh, yeah, I can only say that concrete is a perfect material for the wine fermentation, it's very gentle. 
Of course, uh, that what we do in stainless steel tanks, we cannot do it in concrete tanks. Uh, for example, cold maceration of grapes that we can do in stainless steel tank. We cannot do it in concrete tanks because if the temperature uh, goes below five degrees Celsius, uh, the risk to, to, uh, to break the, the concrete tank is very high. So this is the reason because we use it only for the fermentation. But again, it's a very gentle, a gentle, uh, gentle tank. And I'm very happy about uh, yeah, about the cellar and about these tanks. Here are a picture of the, the small oak barrels where we, uh, my single vineyard, mostly Pinot mature. Yeah, and fact number 10, and now I'm finished with this monologue. This is my love to Riesling, but I don't do Riesling in Italy. 2014, uh, I realized a dream that still my father had, but yeah, I realized it. And I bought a small, small winery in German in the Mosul area, where, yeah, some of the, the greatest Rieslings in the world uh, grow. Here we go. This is the Mosul area. This is the village of Peaceport, Peaceport. And yeah, and since 2014, uh, I produce a German Riesling with an Italian accent. Good. And with this, I'm finished with the monologue. I hope that you have questions, uh, the questions that I can answer. And I will give back to, to Sarah. Thank you, Martin. And um, before we get to the questions, that was a fantastically thorough presentation. So I'm sure you've answered a lot already, but I'd love us to talk a little bit about the wines that we're currently showing at the Wine Society and that we have in our offers mm -hmm. at the moment, because we have a, a specialist Italian, uh, Spanish and Portuguese printed offer that's live. And a few of these wines are, are included in that. And I know that a few of our members yeah in the chat are drinking a few of your wines. So perhaps we could talk about your two Pinot Biancos first. I have wonderfully got a bottle of each with me. Um, and you might be able to tell us, um, you've shown us the grapes and the, the beautiful sights, but could you tell us a little bit about the difference between the two and how you're, how you're yeah, of course. making those styles? Yeah, so I, I mentioned the gentleman Walter in a slide before. He was the one who was picking the Schiava grapes. Uh, I forgot to mention that, uh, yeah, I, in the family here in the winery, we have 55 hectares of own production, of own vineyards, but we also buy grapes from farmers uh, from the village and the surrounding villages for approximately other 75, almost 80 hectares. So uh, this translates also in labels. So the label and the bottle that you see here, this is my, how I used to say my classic uh, Pinot Bianco. It's mostly produced uh, from grapes that I buy from my long-term contract farmers. 100% uh, stainless steel. And it's not from a specific vineyard, but this is a blend of different Pinot Bianco uh, vineyards uh, spread out in different locations uh, in the valley. Um, and yeah, again, to use my words, my classic range of, of my wines are, I don't want to say not the everyday wines, but they should reflect Alto Adige, the climate, which is fresh and clear. Uh, the wine, this is like, like you can drink this wine and have the feeling when you have your feet in a mountain river who cools down your feet. That's how I want my wine, refreshing with nice acidity, fresh and fruity. Well, I love how you say that because I, I mentioned in my introduction, I'm always amazed when um, something is, I'm sure, is, is, you know, something is symptomatic or psychosymptomatic of, of seeing the region and then tasting the wines. But there is something about 
this Pinot Blanc for me that is that very pure, very crystalline sort of alpine um, wine. And it's always got for me a little bit of that herbal note, sage, um, thyme, those sort of lovely, um, yeah, herbal, herbal alpine flavors that I, I think of when I, I taste it. Um, and incredibly yeah. um, pure in its fruit profile, uh, reflective of the steel, I'm sure. And, and of course, the, the wonderful nature of the grapes you're getting on, uh, on harvest. Yeah. And I, 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 have, I have also my, let me say, my personal scale. And the scale is uh, as faster the bottle empties, more enjoyable is the wine. <laughs> yes, oh, I see that. And so then compared yeah, here to... We go. Yes. Yeah, here we go. This is uh, my single vineyard. Uh, so this wine comes from the Bartenau estate. Here we are on the east side of the valley. So from the cooler spot, it's Pinot Bianco as well, but it comes from a specific vineyard, which is, yeah, the Vigna San Michele. So the name of the vineyard is San Michele. And here we have the Vigna declaration or classification of the wine. So this is a specific wine from a specific plot. What we do differently uh, than, of course, the vineyard, which is the most important in this wine. This wine ferments in uh, big oak barrels. Big means 3,000 liter and 5,000 liter. So the bigger oval casks, wooden casks. And after the fermentation, the wine remains on his own lease for approximately other 15 years months. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, let me say a Grand Cru Pinot Bianco from, uh, from Alto Adige. Oh. It definitely has um, a degree of complexity that, um, that is much more um, textural in the, on the palate. It's got that um, slight yogurtiness almost from the lees or the, or the slight um, texture note on the, on the side of the mouth from the, from the oak aging, I think. But, um, but no, a, a we actually have somebody in the chat, uh, Sean, who is, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, but is um, enjoying the 2014 uh, now, And so a wine that clearly ages well. And I know that I often get um, a little bit of criticism for, for offering quite conservative drink windows with, with all wines, because I'm always much keener that members enjoy wines um, whilst they're still sort of youthful and, and you know, before they become perhaps um, a little bit more... Um, Marmite in, in an English fashion. So the idea that you can love and hate an older wine. But um, but actually, yeah. Pinot Bianco is a fantastic cellar worthy wine, isn't it? How how when do you enjoy drinking them? Uh, I can only agree what uh, Sean was writing in the chat. Uh, right now with the 19 Pinot Bianco San Michele, yeah, we are killing a baby. Uh, those wines are as I know this, the, this wine, they start to get, okay, the 19th is good now, but personally, I, I love them with a minimum aging uh, of five, maybe, maybe uh, six years. There is also to mention, thank God, times are changing a little bit and the consumers are more and more accepting also white wines with a little bit of aging. Uh, yeah, I say thank God because uh, Italians are a little bit crazy about about that. Believe it or not, we 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 receive telephone calls from our sales uh, agents uh, in Italy in November when they are asking when the new vintage is coming out. Yeah, it's 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 crazy, but the tendency is, as I was explaining, that uh, consumers are expecting also a little bit aging on white ones and this yeah this is good yeah absolutely and then if we can talk a little bit about your uh Le Grand. yeah for myself a glass. Le Grand. uh this is uh a local indigenous grape variety and yeah the first the first mention of my village tramin uh third 1996, I guess, was related to a variety named at this time Lagarino. 
So this to underline how old this, uh, this variety is. Uh, to use my words, Lagrange is a typical alpine boy. It has a lot of acidity, a lot of tannins, and yeah, sometimes the tannins are, are the big problems. So my personal philosophy is to use a little bit, let me say, stupid wine uh, uh, words. This is my minimum interventing winemaking wine. <laughs> so because my philosophy is less you do, less you do with the Lagrange during the fermentation. With less doing, I mean, less you punch down, less you pump around, better it is. Because if you exaggerate with, with this process, the risk to extract too much tannin on Lagrange is very high. And uh, a Lagrange, an over-extracted Lagrange with too much tannins, First of all, those tannins will not soften down in the next hundred years. Second, yeah, you don't have, let me say, a great mouth feeling uh, with green tannins if you drink a wine like this. Mm. So again, my philosophy is let you do better it is. Many, many times, and especially here on my classic Lagrines, I, I wreck the wine before the end of the fermentation. So at the peak of the extraction, no more skin contact. Again, because I want the wine smooth and drinkable. And here we go. I think you have more than achieved that, but I, I always love um, that this wine has a savory note. It's, it's got a very distinctive um, black or sort of um, dark brambly fruit profile. But that fruit is, is always underlaid with something quite savory and earthy or sort of almost stony in its nature. I think that tends to, um, at least for me, it, it gives a real interest in, in the wine and works with that very high acid. And, and of course, as you say, quite well structured red wine um, and makes it a perfect mm -hmm. partner for, for quite a lot of yeah. food. I know that this is um, a bit of a foodie wine. Absolutely. Uh, thanks to the acidity, which is very important if you are enjoying a, a wine in combination with food. Yeah. yeah. And then last I see here there was there was a there was a question. What are his main export markets? Uh, <laughs> Don't worry much about you, you the question. We will. We no, will no, come no, to no, them. No, I promise. No. Okay. But okay. Before okay, we, before we answer the export markets. Will you tell us a little bit about your Pinot Noir, Pinot Nero, I should say. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tell us how you're making there this, because I know that, that winemakers can be obsessive about how they make their Pinots. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, you can make Pinot only if you, if you love Pinot. I was already uh, say, saying that. And uh, yeah, uh, I grew up with Pinot. My father put a, a lifetime in working with Pinot. We had uh, this great luck that uh, thanks to my grandfather when he bought the estate to already to find Pinot grapes, uh, grapes there. And uh, yeah, this is my Reserva Mazzon. So to use a French expression, this is my Appellation Village. So this is not from a specific vineyard as the Vigna Sant'Urbano, uh, for example, which is the, in a certain way, the big brother, the big brother of the Reserva Mazzon. So this is a wine made out of different Pinot vineyards, which are in, pro in property of the family in the area Mazzon. Mm -hmm. And this wine is also made from my youngest, uh vines so the average age is approximately 20 25 years classic red wine fermentation uh in the oh, mostly in the concrete tanks that you have seen before in the picture uh okay how many times i punch down and i pump around this depends from harvest uh, from harvest uh to how or from vintage to uh, to vintage so uh in warm vintages we 
punch down a little bit more in cool vintages, we try to keep the tannin extraction similar to the Lagrange extract less as possible. The big, big news are that uh, since uh, last year, all my pinots go through an optical selection machine. This means we distem dis the, the cluster and the single vineyards go through a machine. This is a machine who takes 10,000 pictures in one second. So it makes a picture of every single berry at an incredibly high speed. And with air pressure, when the, the, the parameters that the analogist that he puts in, the parameters are mostly the color of the, of the, the berry. So meaning if the color tends more to go in direction green, blue, green, which means not 100% drive, the, uh, the compressed air is kicking the berries out. So, First of all, we have the selection in the vineyards from, from the people who uh, harvest. And then we have this, let me say, ultra selection that we do in the winery made from a machine. And I have to say, after the concrete tanks, this machine was, uh, uh, let me say, a great investment because really it, it changed my life. And yeah. I hope that it increased my the quality mm -hmm. uh, the quality of my wines of the of my wines mm -hmm. too. But again, the Reserva mm -hmm. Mazon is Appellation Village, different vineyards from the area Mazon. No, the the optical berry sorters are um, a sight to be seen. So that's um, very very impressive. But of course, your your Pinot is is just such a, a sort of um, again, it's that purity of Pinot flavor. So it's got that very classic red currant and red berry flavor and that very well managed fine grained tannins i think it's um it's a wonderful fine wine again another wine that could could go very well in the cellar for a number of years before before being enjoyed i'm going to quickly skip to anna because i can i can see that we have been we must be running out of time but um i know that the question was parried in the in the chat around the export markets so I wonder if you could, Martin, so, uh, talk a little bit about that. No, it, it, big export. No, that's, that's, that, that's very funny. Uh, you already understood that here in Alto Adige, we are a little bit, let me say, different Italians because we are German speaking. <laughs> we are German speaking. It was a part of Austria. Then it joined Italy. And there is this funny story who is... 20 or 30 years ago, somebody asked my father, uh, where is our main export market? And the answer of my father was Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah. we are, uh, my main market, my main market uh, is Italy. So 80%, 75% of the wine remains uh, in Italy from the Brenner Pass, which is the Northern Peak, down to, to Sicily, Pantelleria. Uh, so we have uh, a good net of these agents and we sell uh, direct into, into restaurants. So 75% remains in Italy and not including Alto Adige as well. And the rest a little bit all over the world. So in terms of quantity, uh, United States are important. Uh, Germany is very important. Yeah, thanks to Wine Society, also the UK, of course. And, uh, and for the rest, a little bit all over the world where uh, people drink wine. So Japan is a traditional export market uh, for us, 30 plus years. Uh, Russia is doing well. The only market which I'm not selling except Hong Kong, but I'm not selling not one bottle to China. Personally, right now, or right now, I, I never believed in China. I think uh, they are not ready for Alto Adige wine. We are too small for them, too small for them. And yeah, I said, we are nobodies in terms of production and quantity in Italy. Try to imagine what we are for, for, for the Chinese population, our wines, nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. Anna, I'm Thank sure we babe. have a few more. <laughs> we have plenty of questions through on the Q&A, but um, yes, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Martin, so much for a really fascinating presentation. 
Um, we were just talking about exports, so uh, we'll obviously talk about what's available in the UK. Uh, we have had a couple of questions in, um, one around the Gewürztraminer, and um, one around uh, the, the sweet wine or the dessert wine you talked about, Martin. So it's a bit of a joint question here. Sarah, what, why do we not have the Gewürz? <laughs> and when, <laughs> when might we get it? <laughs> So, um, so we have stocked the Martin's Gewurz a number of times over the last few years, but um, unfortunately, I I just can't list everything he makes. So, <laughs> so I seem to have my favourites, which seem to align with Sebastian's. And so the, the Pinot Bianco and the, the Lagrine, the Pinot Nero are more frequently listed. Um, but that's not to say that we wouldn't um, jump at the opportunity if we have the right offer and the right listing to, to stock. Uh, the Gewurz again, the, diver- the dessert wines... Um, and actually, you know, I was excited by the sparkling wine that Martin mentioned earlier and I tasted it last time I was there. And so there are lots of things that we would love to love to have um, small parcels of at some point. Um, so keep an eye on our on our range. Watch this space. I think the answer for that one. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sarah. Now back to you, Martin. We've had two questions, um, one from Joe, uh, one from Russell, another from Alex. Um, Thank you, Martin and Sarah. I'll just read Alex's. Uh, I love this region's wine and food, but do you have any particular favourite foods from the area to match the wines? Woo! Uh, well, that's that's an interesting uh, question. Um, for varieties like the Lagrine and the Schiava, and as well Gewürztraminer because Gewürztraminer also has a little bit of smoke, a smoke, a smoky touch. Uh, we have this uh, a, a very typical and a very famous smoked ham which is called speck here in Altuarije, and uh, of course you can enjoy the speck uh, in slices too. But you can make uh, many different, uh, or you can use speck in many different ways. For example, the speck knödel. The speck dumplings, they are one of my, they're one of my uh, favorites and uh, a good class of schiava or lagrine, lagrine with the speck knödel is, uh, yeah, something very great. Uh, for the rest, uh, very difficult because we have many different food and now there is a little bit uh, a wave that the Alto Arige chefs, like, like a little bit everywhere in the world, they are this, this discovering the, the local vegetables, the, the local the local meat, uh, the local herbs. Yeah, there is a lot of going on with many different dishes here uh, in Alto Adige right now. But uh, yeah, let's for the moment stay on spec and on the spec dumplings and uh, of course, I love Gewürztraminer with, with, with Thai food, which, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot get that often here in Alto Adige. And, yeah, I look forward to come back to London. I was going to say, Anna, one of my favorite pairings here is the either of the Pinot Biancos, but especially the Bartna with um, roast chicken. I think it's a fantastic oh, yeah. match, especially if you were using a lot of herbs in your roast chicken. It really stands up well and brings out, you know, the herbal nature of both wines. Wonderful. Thank you. That's making me hungry for for my dinner, (laughs) especially speck noodle, which I'm going to have to look a recipe up to make because that sounds delicious. Um, We're going to squeeze in two more questions, if it's all right, Martin. Uh, We did have one member email us earlier, um, a question around, I think, um, in particular, cuvées and the blending of La Grenne. Um, so I wondered if you could elaborate a little more on that. Is it a single vineyard or are you blending different sites? And if so, why? So no, the, the classic Lagrine that you had on the glass is uh, similar to the, the, the Pinot Bianco, the first wine. The, the first Pinot Bianco is a blend of, of different uh, vineyards spread out in the valley. But uh, those vineyards, they have, uh, let me say, one thing. Lagrine needs warm vineyards and light soils. So the Lagrine grows in different in different areas, uh, which are close by. But uh, in uh, the soil is typical, this, almost the same uh, the same uh, for every for every vineyard. 
uh, blending La Grain. I'm not, I'm not uh, a big fan of red cubes with La Grain because uh, La Grain is a very dominant varieties. So it happens that when you use the Lagrange blended in Cabernet, blended in Merlot, for example, uh, the Lagrange jumps out. And uh, I love to keep it on, on its own, then again in a cuvee. There are a few producers here in Alto Adige who are using these varieties for cuvee, but yeah, not me. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, that answered the question perfectly, so thank you. Um, and the last question is really a wanderlust question now that you've got everyone hungry um, and also absolutely dazzled us with some amazing images. Um, would you be able to tell us a little more about visiting the region, Martin, and hopefully coming to visit you as well? So uh, visiting, I don't know if there uh, is still the flight from the Verona airport to Gatwick. So this was uh, in the past the fastest way to, to, to come to the U UK. The other option is uh, to fly into Innsbruck, which I guess they had in the past and hopefully soon again, a direct flights uh, to, uh, to London. Uh, if you fly in from Munich, take the train and come south, or uh, the same, the same Verona, which I mentioned, and the same uh, from uh, from Milan. What can I suggest here? Of course, uh, visit wine land Alto Adige, but of course, if you are here, go to visit the Dolomites. The the mountains there are are just stunning not only for climbing, but also for, uh, for hiking. But uh, go to Bolzano, to our main city, visit Etsy, which is our, the, 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 the famous ice man. Go to visit this museum, which is uh, stunning, uh, stunning as well. Take a swim in the Caldaro Lake, which is uh, only five minutes away uh, from my village. The Caldaro Lake is also the biggest lake, uh, the biggest lake in, uh, in Alto Adige. Okay, big is a big word, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the biggest lake uh, in Alto Adige. So uh, as we have a, a great diversity of different grape varieties here in Alto Adige, we also have a great diversity of different spots we have. We have from the warm lakes up to the cooler, the cooler mountains, a little bit of everything. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you've just painted the most wonderful picture for everybody sat looking at their screens. At home. <laughs> and um, I wonder how much uh, internet traffic there will be to various, uh, various uh, aeroplane and sky scanners and all sorts of things looking at flights to come and visit. It does sound absolutely magical. Um, but I think with that, uh, it's just up to me to thank you, Sarah, for hosting a wonderful evening. And I will hand over to you, but a personal thank you, Martin, for an absolutely fascinating evening and some great comments in the chat. Members have really enjoyed hearing about your wines and also the, the special part of the world that you're from. So I'll hand over to Sarah for yeah. a final goodbye, but thank you. Um, of course, it, it leaves me to thank Anna and the team behind the scenes here for running such a great Zoom event as always. And Martin, it's a huge pleasure to see you. I'm so sorry that I haven't been able to visit in the last, last year or so, but I am, I am now keener than ever to return and to, uh, to be able to taste your wines with you in your cellar again, uh, hopefully very soon. Uh, but until then, um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for uh, enlightening us all about your wines. I hope, members, you've had a great um, educational evening, but also have a glass in front of you. And we'll give these wines a try with some, with some food if you haven't already become a huge fan. But uh, thank you so much for joining us, Martin. As always, cheers, everybody. Thank you. Sarah, thank you. Anna, thank you. And uh, yeah, goodbye to everything. And thank you for the attention. And yeah, come to visit me. Don't believe in one word what I told you in the last hour. Come to visit <laughs> me. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.